Yes, yeah, Saucer News was one of the very early publications in the UFO field, and there were two or three that started before I did, but they've died out along the way. And uh, I changed the name also along the way. It's now called Saucer Smear, uh, because uh, whereas in the earlier days, in the 50s and 60s, I mainly tracked sightings and I ran articles of opinion by various experts, etc. And then I decided that was not the real me. So in the 70s and thereafter, I changed it to Saucer Smear, which is a gossip sheet devoted to sarcastic humor, innuendo, and occasionally libel, but we try to avoid the latter if possible. One time, Gray Barker said to me, jokingly, he had bought the title Saucer News from me, okay, and then I started up again, and I called it Saucer News, and he said, well, you can't do that. I said, well, then we'll call it Saucer Jews, Saucer Blues, anything else but Saucer News, and that was just a little fun thing that we were doing, and then finally I thought uh, the Saucer Smear uh, expressed my uh, frame of mind better than any of the other titles, so about 1980, I stuck with Saucer Smear. I published Saucer Smear because it's a fun hobby. It gets me interviews like this one and uh, eventually will lead to a book next year. And uh, I uh, enjoy uh, doing this. It's uh, a fun hobby. Yeah, I started traveling around the country in the fall of 1953. I had met a, a professional writer named Ken Crepine who was quite well known at that time uh, as a adventure writer. He, he wrote regularly for Argosy Magazine and some others and uh, was fully employed as a writer and lecturer on, as I say, travel rather than UFOs. But he knew I was interested in UFOs and at one point he agreed to co-author a UFO book with me. And since I was just uh, getting started, I was quite flattered and so forth. And I said, well, I'll go at my own expense around the country and get all of the current information available on the subject of UFOs. And then uh, we'll get together in about three months and uh, uh, look over what I have and use that as the basis of a, of a manuscript. And that part didn't work out, which is a long story. But <clears throat> I did take my own car and my own time. And I traveled from northern New Jersey out through the southwest to Los Angeles and then back again, more of a central route. Uh, on the way back, incidentally, I uh, interviewed Harry Truman in uh, Missouri. He was just out of office then, and I had quite an interesting short interview with him. But anyway, the whole thing was about uh, 10 or 12 weeks, and I interviewed over 100 people who were mentioned in the early UFO books as having seen something or having made a public statement on UFOs or whatever that would be of uh, help for the book, and that was how I got started. And actually, the book was never done, and it'll probably come out next year, which would be 2002, and that's a little later than 1954. So the most famous of the contactees was George Adamski, and he had just written his book called Flying Saucers Have Landed, uh, which was co-authored with an Englishman named Desmond Leslie. Well, Desmond Leslie wrote most of the book. It was about sightings of unknown objects going all the way back B.C. up into the present time and uh, was quite interesting, but a short section that was added to the book as an enticement at the last minute almost was written by George Adamski, who claimed to be a, a professor living in Southern California, not attached to any observatory or anything, but that was his honorary title. And he told about how he had had a meeting on the desert with a space creature, which I believe he called Orthon. And it's a long story involving six other witnesses. And that was the basic story that he told in Flying Saucers Have Landed. Saucer News did bring him down. It was the definitive uh, expose. And it was based on my conversation with Adamski. And I took the trouble to meet five of the six wit witnesses who had been with him on this famous desert contact that I mentioned before when he went out on the desert uh, in Southern California and actually met a space being in broad daylight. Uh, these people were not quite what they were represented to be. There were other people in his circle who contradicted most of what was uh, said and done that day. And when you put it all together, it was not what it purported to be and certainly not an example of contact with an outer space being. 
He was uh, a man that I never was personally angry with. He had this philosophy that we mentioned earlier, which was a harmless sort of thing. Some people would call it left wing, but it wasn't uh, evil or anything. And uh, uh, I had nothing personally against him. I just thought he'd made up the whole story. Well, the Strays letter came about because in the late 50s, uh, Gray Barker had a friend who was the son of a high State Department official in Washington, who shall still remain nameless, and uh, because the father would be dead, but the son would probably still be alive. And as a joke, uh, this kid sent Gray stationery, not only from the State Department, where his father worked, but from several other government agencies. And it's not generally known that seven letters were sent out the same night or the same day, uh, along with the straight being one of the seven. And uh, in brief, the Straits letter just gave encouragement to George Adamski, uh, said uh, basically, we of the State Department cannot come out openly and support your claims, but certainly some of us here feel that you really are on to something and we'd like to encourage you off the record. You see, that was the gist of it. And it was written by Gray Barker right in front of me, and I mailed these letters from Washington the next day, it made it more official. Uh, but of the several letters that we mailed, the only one that became a classic was the Straits letter, and uh, eventually the State Department and the FBI became interested, and uh, they never really proved that Barker's typewriter was the right one, but they strongly suspected it, and uh, legend has it that Barker hacked that typewriter to pieces and buried it in a wall somewhere in Clarksburg where there was construction going on at that time, and uh, he snuck in and uh, hit it in the wet cement in some way, and he wouldn't even tell me which wall. So somewhere there, when they tear down Clarksburg, they'll find the pieces of this typewriter. And uh, I guess that sets the tone right there. I also met several of the other well-known contactees of that period, and uh, I thought that was an important part of the book that I was going to write. Gabriel Green. Now, Gabriel Green had a thing called Amalgamated Flying Saucers of America. And uh, that was a membership organization. I don't know how many hundreds or maybe even thousands he might have had at his peak. And uh, uh, so since it was an actual club, you could call it a group. And he had his own uh, philosophy. He even ran for president in 1960. Lost, by the way. But mainly the philosophy was that the space people are here to help us. That was the thing that you heard again and again, that man is stupid, mankind doesn't know what he's doing, he's going to ruin the earth and end civilization as we know it. And so the kindly space brothers are here to keep us from doing that and to save us from ourselves. I, I knew uh, Major Aho slightly. Uh, he kept uh, going in the UFO lecture circuit until just recent years. He was on Long John's show uh, one time, or, or several times, I think. I was on with him once or twice. I remember when he came to New York one time, something happened to Wayne Aho in Greenwich Village. He got into some terrible trouble and got uh, thrown into Bellevue uh, for a short while. And uh, I don't know if that interfered with one of his appearances or if it was after the appearance, but it was on the same trip that he had made to New York to be on the Long John show. Yeah, Long John was not a believer in any of it. He, he just uh, found that the offbeat was a good way to increase his audience and uh, get more listeners, and that was, I think, his only interest. He often told me, because I was like halfway in, not all the way in, as I indicated earlier, and he said, well, you know, there are, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. He said, you know, uh, I have to deal with these nuts on the show, and, and that's what I do, but uh, I keep them at arm's length. This is my business. If I'm not on the show, I don't talk to them, or I really don't have anything to do with them, something like that. But I, <laughs> since he was talking to me, I didn't think he meant me too. So one time uh, during that period, it would be about 1963 when I was married, and it happened that Long John and his wife of that era, he had several wives at different times, and they happened to have the theater seats right next to me and my wife. And it was no seats in between or you didn't have to lean over to the next row. We were just by coincidence right next to each other. And uh, we both, of course, recognized Long John. And I leaned over and said, hi, John. And I had to say it five times, I think, before he would answer. And then he growled. 
And that was the extent of our conversation. And then I wondered, why did he do that? But then I remembered his rule. And of course, I didn't ever like Long John either before or after that, to tell you the truth. I did a record one time uh, in anticipation of the big convention I had in New York City in 1967. Well, Long John that time did do me quite a favor. Uh, we made a professional quality LP, a 33 uh, record, of, of him interviewing me on the subject of UFOs. He gave me the studio time for free. Uh, one of his henchmen did a lot of the technical work. And I think, if I'm right, I brought out a thousand records for a thousand dollars, which was pretty decent. And I owned them then, and I could sell them for anything I wanted. And that was a pretty good deal. Uh, he would start at midnight and go to 5 a.m. And Long John himself would hog the first hour or so, and the panel would not be able to talk. Obviously, by 1 o'clock or so, most of the people would have tuned out. So by the time the panel got to talk, there was a much smaller audience. Then the guest of the evening would be the first person that would be interviewed by Long John. And that might go on just Long John and the guest of the evening for another half hour or an hour. Then usually there would be three additional panelists as background figures. And sometimes it would be two in the morning before I got a chance to open my mouth. Uh, then you'd have a coffee break roughly from 2 to 2.30, go off the air and literally have sandwiches and stuff from a nearby delicatessen and then go back on until 5 o'clock. And then, of course, it got more open and wilder toward the end because uh, we kind of knew nobody was listening, you know, and uh, finally at 5 o'clock we'd break. Yeah, most of the time we were on WOR in New York. Later he got more money from WNBC, uh, which didn't have as uh, large a range and therefore had le less listeners, but uh, he was satisfied to change. I don't think the format changed. It was just one big table with a mic in front of everybody and then the pecking order that I indicated earlier. And people spoke only when they were supposed to and kept quiet uh, in front of an open mic uh, when they were supposed to keep quiet. Sometimes that would be kind of difficult to do, but if you didn't follow Long John's rules, you didn't come back, naturally. Oh, yeah, well, he had his own coterie of regular panelists uh, who would go on any show, and I can't remember most of their names now, but I mostly was only invited on the, the offbeat shows in general or the UFO shows in particular. I wasn't a regular in the sense of uh, maybe once a week or something like some of these other people were. Uh, sometimes I'd be on a couple of times a month and sometimes uh, several months would go by and I wouldn't be on at all. Had a lot to do with what kind of a mood Long John was in. He'd get mad at you and ban you for a while and then you'd be back. Well, Long John would give the uh, guest of the evening, whoever it was, a chance to tell his story without uh, sarcasm or ridicule, at least on the first run through. Uh, Long John would do a pretty straight interview with him to begin with, because after all, the guy was a guest and uh, the people listening were believers and he didn't want to uh, tear it apart. But then, as I indicated earlier, after the coffee break, he would let the panelists loose. And usually the panelists were uh, negative, uh, more or less, and uh, were able to ask uh, penetrating questions sometimes, and it would get more evenly balanced as the evening went on. Did you know that James Randi, who is now sort of an enemy of mine, he had a rival show to Long John during part of that same period, and that's how I got to know uh, Randi. He had an every night five-hour talk show on WOR after uh, Long John switched to WNBC. And I got on his show a lot more frequently than I did on Long John. Long John made an edict that anyone that went even once on James Randi's show would never be on his show again. And I, having the choice of the two shows, and at that time being very friendly with Randi and not ever having liked Long John at all, and I know he is dead, so I can say all this, uh, I decided to uh, go on Randy's show and I became a real regular there, which I had never been on, on Long John's, and I was on two or three times a week, maybe partly because Randy lived in Rumson, New Jersey, which is about 40-some miles from, from Manhattan, and guess what? I had a car and I could drive him home every night at 5 in the morning, whereas nobody else was available to do that. That might have had something to do with my getting on that often. But the fun thing was, I figured, well, I'll never be on Long John again, but who cares? Eventually came the flap of 1966. 
the marsh gas flap, which you've probably heard of, and suddenly saucers became big, just as they did recently with Roswell. This was the same kind of thing, just something triggered a tremendous amount of public interest. And guess what? I broke the curse. Uh, Long John very meekly, no, he didn't do it. He had an intermediary, intermediary call me and invite me back on the show as if nothing had happened because he needed me and that was nice and I went back on the show. By that time, Randy was off the air. He'd, he'd been kicked off and uh, so I never was a man without a show. Long John, I don't remember what year he died. He died of cancer. 70, late 70s. Yeah, Long John died of cancer very painfully. And it was very, very sad, even though I didn't like him, but he, he went through agony and several operations and so forth, and he wouldn't quit the show. He was still running the show uh, a few days before he died. Well, I first met Gray Barker in the fall of 90, or excuse me, 53, when I started the trip that I just told you about. Uh, I made sure I went through Clarksburg, West Virginia, where he lived, and that was on my way out west. And then uh, Gray and I became very close friends, as you know, and we stayed in touch until his death in 1984. And I, I would come down here to Clarksburg uh, three or four times a year, spend a weekend, and we just would drink and have fun and uh, enjoy the subject, you might say. And then two or three times a year, he'd, he'd go up to New Jersey or somewhere else. Gray Barker, <clears throat> first of all, he knew more than anyone else did about the hush-up of Albert K. Bender. That's really what that book is based on. And Albert K. Bender, in the early 1950s uh, had what was probably the first formal UFO group, and that was the International Flying Saucer Bureau. He was, I believe, a timekeeper for a factory in Bridgeport, Connecticut. He was not a particularly educated man, but he had a hobby of horror, science fiction, and eventually UFOs. So he started this club. It was international because he had a few members in England and so forth. He started a little magazine called, uh, I forget the name of it now, but anyway, Space Something. And uh, he uh, had quarterly issues and was pretty moderate about everything until after about one year, he suddenly went off the chart and uh, sent out a uh, issue which said that he had been visited in his home or at his apartment really uh, by three men in black who sounded like they might be either supernatural entities, space people, or government agents. He deliberately made it rather vague. I believe he said they floated off the floor, so that would be a little bit odd for government agents, although they can do a lot of things. And uh, the point was, so he had n uh, found the answer. He had satisfied his curiosity, and then he left everybody else dangling. He said, well, they told me not to tell anybody, what I learned, and so that's that, and I'm closing down my organization, and of course he left everybody hanging and panting for more information. Well, Gray Barker had been one of the charter members of the IFSB, and had been in regular correspondence with Bender, and probably met him two or three times, and uh, so he kind of had the inside track on the story, and then he got together some other alleged hush-up cases that were in some ways similar to Gray Barker's, and he put them all together and wrote the uh, book. Barker b probably believed Bender at the very beginning. I think he was fascinated by it, but Barker's background was in motion picture lore. He never became a movie producer, which I think he would have liked to have been, but he was a booking agent for about 30 drive-in theaters in West Virginia for a period of time until the drive-in started closing. And uh, he also ran uh, a little theater in the town of Buchanan, West Virginia for several years. So he got as close as he could to the theatrical business, you might say. And I think he saw UFO research as a form of theater, a source of wonderment, and something that represented entertainment rather than truth. And that's how he wrote uh, the book they knew too much about, Flying Saucers. He wanted it to entertain people, and if they happened to believe it, that was their problem. Well, that's an interesting uh, thing, whether we could almost wonder if uh, Barker, <laughs> if Barker's estate shouldn't get some rake off from the fact that the men in black are, is a uh, standard phrase now. And of course, there was a movie by that name, which I thought wasn't very good, but it is part of the popular lore now, and. Uh, I guess as much as anyone else, he invented it. Gray Barker wrote a book called The Silver Bridge 
1970, which quite frankly I have never read, and I'm starting to regret it because all this weekend we've been talking about it, and uh, um, a lot of people know more about the book than I do since I didn't read it, but I know it does include the uh, story of Moth Man, which was the sighting of some winged creature by several people in the uh, West Virginia area, and then finally, of course, the culmination of that episode would be the collapse of the Silver Bridge in 1970. All of that's in there, and I think quite a bit more. I really couldn't speak more highly of Carl Flock. He is a real pro. We work beautifully together. We talk on the phone and send back and forth to each other everything that's needed, and uh, uh, I couldn't think of a better uh, partner. The reason it took me all these years to write a book is laziness, I guess, more than anything else, because it is a, a big job. I'm a, a professional writer, and I've been published in, in different places, but uh, uh, it's not just inspiration, you know, unless you're Hemingway or something. It's perspiration, and I've never had the economic push, you might say, to have to produce literature, and so I have just sat on my ass for a long time and not been motivated enough to do this. Now, finally, I'm 69 now, I'm just finally doing what I first thought of doing in 1954. Stanton Friedman I know very well uh, for way over 30 years. He came onto the college lecture circuit on UFOs uh, in the early 60s, I guess, and there was a period of time that we were rivals on the college lecture uh, circuit. Uh, then I dropped out of that circuit for various reasons, and uh, we are friends, I guess, but we have very different points of view about UFOs. Philip Klass, uh, I think, is a personal friend of mine. He's quite ill now. Uh, I haven't seen him in a while. I used to have dinner with him, stay at his house quite a lot. Our views differ, but I respect him in spite of differences. Bruce Maccabee is a genuine physicist. I believe a very gullible person, but probably sincere. A nice guy, I've met him many times. I have nothing against him worse than what I've already said. Gray Barker was probably my best friend for that period of time, and I was very crushed when he died, and I still am. He just went down progressively. He uh, smoked and drank a lot, as I still do, and he had certain proclivities that uh, are well known in the inner circle, and he very likely died of AIDS. Whatever UFOs are, and I do think there is such a thing as UFOs, they are being interpreted in this age as being something having to do with space travel, since we're at the point of starting space travel ourselves. Uh, visions of the same sort in the Middle Ages would be connected with religion, and the devil, and angels, and uh, uh, so forth. All kinds of religious interpretations might be made and were made in that time for similar things that were seen in the sky. So uh, whatever else may be true, the interpretation that we give to unknown events is certainly colored by the culture that we're in and the times that we're in. And so this is the age of space travel and the saucers are supposed to come from space. I don't happen to believe that they do, but I think that there is something going on.